Here are some of the dumbest ideas with the worst results. Number 10. Separate but equal though. At the celebrity-friendly Little Red Schoolhouse in West Village, New York, administrators do things just a little differently. After all, when you pay an arm and a leg for a school, you'd expect some top-notch education, right? Well, let's just say parents were a bit surprised to learn that the school had a little segregation policy in place for their kids. Parents at the almost 50 grand a year private school became aware that director Philip Casson had plans to place all the minority middle school students in the same homerooms in fall of 2018. They also learned that the race-based placement policy had already been in effect for the 2017 to 2018 school year for 7th and 8th graders, and was likely to be expanded to the 6th grade until the backlash. One mom interviewed said that for three years, all but one of the 10 non-white students in her child's grade were assigned to the same class. Another father said classes had been segregated for as long as his daughter was enrolled there. In June 2018, Kasson emailed parents explaining that the proposed class placement policy would be reviewed. Eight days later, he emailed again, stating that he would abolish the policy, but would continue to keep, quote, race as a critical but not primary determinant. He explained the policy was born from conversations with recent graduates, who said that the school could, quote, create greater opportunities for connection and support. He added that research points to the academic, social, and emotional benefits to being in a classroom with others who share racial, ethnic, linguistic, and or cultural backgrounds. Welcome to New York City schooling, everyone! Number 9. Drop it like it's high. When you think of a back-to-school celebration for kindergartners, the first thought into your mind is pole dancing, right? Wait, no? That's a surprise to you? Well, you'd be just as surprised as parents from one school in Shenzhen, China, where they attended a pole dancing ceremony to mark the first day of school. They were horrified to see a woman take the stage and start pole dancing in front of all their kids. Obviously, the event was quickly condemned by the local education bureau, which later on fired the kindergarten director. In a social media post, the Education Bureau of Boan District in Shenzhen warned other kindergarten schools against inappropriate behavior. Kinda telling that you'd need to send out a message of restraint when it comes to kindergartners, don't you think? The video footage of the pole dance, as well as another, um, performance by a second dancer, was widely shared on Twitter and Chinese social media. Amazingly, there were also advertisements for a pole dancing school around the school's courtyard. Are we sure this wasn't in San Francisco? The outrage at the unusual choice of amusement was followed by nationwide complaints from parents who had to sit through 12 minutes of television ads with their children, a mandatory TV blurb from the government. Well, hopefully no one got naked on that one. Number 8. But first, let me take a selfie. Do we really need to say here on Pablito's Way that no selfie is worth the risk of death? But still, 259 people worldwide have died while taking selfies from 2011 to 2017, according to a study published in the Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care. Well, guess there's just gonna be a portion of the population that miscalculates the risk of a situation. Although women generally take more selfies than men, Researchers found that men were more likely to take risks to capture a dramatic shot. They found that the most selfie deaths occurred in India, followed by Russia, the US, and Pakistan. Most of the victims were men, roughly 72% under the age of 30. Drowning is the leading cause of selfie deaths, usually involving people being washed away by waves or falling out of a boat. The second leading cause is listed as transport, for example, trying to snap a quick pic in front of a moving train. Tied for third are selfies involving falls from high places and fires. Yes, fires. If the building is on fire, stop with the selfies, come on! Unsurprisingly, the US led in the number of selfie deaths involving a firearm. Yeah, if you have to take a pic like that, make sure it's unloaded. But really though, what's the point of validation on social media? Number 7. Oops, my bad guys. 
If you decide to take on a risky hobby involving fire, our recommendation is to just not do it. That or at least get educated in the safety of what you're doing. Several buildings in the town of Cohoes in New York went up in flames because of one person who wanted to give it his best shot at sword making. Yes, sword making. Several businesses over three blocks were destroyed and 18 families were left homeless after a giant fire swept through downtown Cohoes. It all started when John Gomez was inspired by Forged in Fire, a History Channel TV competition in which contestants make knives and swords out of red hot metal. Gomez built a fire in a barrel outside his apartment building to try and make a sword of his own. However, embers from the barrel blew into a nearby building. Within minutes, the whole building was fully engulfed. But then, to make things worse, a strong wind blew embers down the street and all of a sudden, the whole downtown erupted in flames. A total of 28 buildings were either destroyed or damaged, including the town library and a local church. Needless to say, Gomez's own place was burnt down along with all his belongings. He eventually was sentenced to a year in jail. All this because he wanted to make his own sword. Number 6. Don't worry, it's just sharks. Even if someone has a PhD, it still doesn't guarantee that they have common sense. Dr. Eric Ritter is a Swiss shark expert with a doctorate and countless hours of experience swimming with sharks. However, he bit off more than he could chew while filming a Discovery Channel documentary about bull sharks. Ritter was in the water with British television personality Nigel Marvin, attempting to demonstrate his belief that sharks' aggressive nature had been misunderstood. Dr. Ritter believes that part of the reason behind many shark attacks is that the shark detects the person's fear, which triggers the animal's attack response. He practices yoga to reduce his own heartbeat when swimming with sharks to make them believe he's a fellow predator and not prey. He claimed that because of his ability to stay calm, he had never even been nipped. Well, the problem for him is that it only takes one mistake in order for things to be really bad. While being filmed for Discovery Channel, Ritter waded into the ocean with only his yoga techniques to protect him. While he was in the water, his assistants proceeded to throw chunks of fish into the water around him. Unfortunately for Ritter, a remora fish darted between his legs. One of the bull sharks, going for the remora, bit off a chunk of Ritter's calf. He was immediately airlifted to a Florida medical center, where doctors managed to save his leg. Ritter recovered successfully, with only a disfiguring scar on his lower leg as a memento, and blames poor visibility in the water for the accident. Well, if you really think about it, he was kinda right, but he forgot that sharks can make mistakes too. Number 5. Did the water change color though? In 2011, an unnamed 21-year-old man was caught peeing in Mount Tabor Reservoir, a key water supply for Portland, Oregon. The guy said he thought that the reservoir was a sewage treatment plant, as it was an uncovered pool of random water in the middle of nowhere. Well, him thinking of preserving the ground actually had a huge consequence. The municipality quickly decided to dump all the water. Yep, all 7.8 million gallons. But really though, if you think about it, it's kinda ridiculously dumb to dump out all that water just because one guy peed in it. Especially if you keep in mind that the officials in charge of Portland's drinking water freely admit that they have to keep fishing out rotting animals out of the open reservoirs. They never empty out the reservoirs after that. I mean, they're just rotting animals. I hope you can tell we're joking here. For some reason, a guy peeing in the reservoir caused officials to flip out. Yes, the guy did make a bad decision and no one likes to drink pee. Well, almost no one. Anyways, when confronted with questions about exactly what kind of biohazard the contents of the average human bladder present to a 7.8 million gallon reservoir already rife with dead fauna, the head of the Water Bureau just repeated the question and stated that it has nothing to do with science. Well, here's to drinking filtered water. Number 4. Just why? If you decide to play with fireworks, please guys, make sure you do it safely. A 22-year-old celebrating the 4th of July back in 2015 decided to launch fireworks from the top of his head. Yes, launch fireworks off his head. Devon Staples was drinking with family and friends in Calais, Maine, 
a small town near the Canadian border. When he put a reloadable fireworks mortar tube on his head and threatened to light it, mortar tubes are usually made from cardboard and used to hold prepackaged charges, although authorities didn't know what kind of fireworks were in the shell. Staples' friends thought they had talked him out of the stunt and went back to the fire pit. Then they realized he had put the mortar tube on his head and was already lighting it. Of course, the firework exploded, causing a fatal head injury. Staples' brother, 25-year-old Cody Staples, called it an accident and added that Devon wasn't the kind of person who would do something stupid. Well, Cody obviously doesn't recognize stupidity when he sees it and hopefully he won't have the same unfortunate consequence as his brother one day. Number 3. Kiss Kiss Well, now we've gotten to the snake charming section of the video. Is it just us or is anything involving snakes just gonna be a big no? 21-year-old snake catcher Somnath Mater from India spent his life as a snake charmer for a hobby. There are plenty of other hobbies out there that don't involve charming anything that has highly potent venom, but whatever, YOLO, right? You'd think someone picking kissing snakes would realize that one day things would end badly, the same way a person who picks crossing the street blindfolded as a hobby would. Unfortunately for Somnath, in 2017, he met his demise trying to kiss a cobra that wasn't feeling it that day. He was admitted to a hospital with a bite on his chest, but he succumbed three days later. He reportedly rescued the trapped snake from underneath a car. As we hinted at earlier, this wasn't his first close-up with snakes. Mater's Facebook profile was filled with photos of him playing and cuddling with venomous snakes. His demise made the authorities sound the alarm though, if there were any good to come of it. The Rest Kink Association of Wildlife Welfare in India began urging a ban for any close snake encounters. Snake charming seems to be a problem for the area as two other snake catchers had the same thing happen in the same area within a year. Number 2. How about nah? In November of 2018, members of an isolated Sentinelese tribe armed with bows and arrows decided that they didn't like John Allen Chow and, you know, decided to end things quickly for him. Cho was an American who wanted to preach Christianity to the tribe members. Now how can this be dumb, you might be thinking? Well, it's just that it's the same reaction the Sentinelese tribe had had with anyone that's tried to make contact. The reaction of trying to put arrows through anyone alive, that is. Chow paid local fishermen to ferry him to North Sentinel Island, home to the tribes, even though the local fishermen knew of the dangers. Chow actually was able to make contact with members of the tribe several times when he was still with the fishermen. He sang worship songs and tried to communicate in English to the tribe members, but he retreated to his canoe where the fishermen were waiting each time the tribe members would get close. However, on his last day, he completed the rest of the journey alone in a kayak and instructed the fishermen to leave without him. Once Cho approached the shore, the fishermen leaving saw an arrow hit him ending Cho's hope for anything right on the spot. Come on, what was he hoping to accomplish considering that he couldn't speak their language? The Sentinelese are thought to have had no contact with surrounding communities ever since 1991. Starting in the 1990s, anthropologists succeeded in conducting field visits with the tribe, but abandoned their efforts later on because of increasing hostility. Now the Indian government has what it calls a hands-off, eyes-on policy to the tribe meaning officials moor boats near the island every few months to check on the inhabitants welfare but don't try to establish any contact yeah i think it's well established these guys just want to be left alone number one the bird box challenge is not watching bird box how many of you guys have watched bird box if you haven't the basic bird box challenge is just wearing a blindfold while wandering around outside now nah, we won't reveal any spoilers some people such as some <clears throat> youtubers have tried to go about their daily lives for 24 hours while blindfolded. Netflix's social media team actually had to warn fans against participating in a potentially dangerous online challenge that's inspired by its hit film. Do we really need to say don't walk around outside blindfolded? We know you guys are smarter than that. If you do see anyone doing the bird box challenge, do us a favor and put a banana peel in front of them. Here's what's next. 